What's up brand builders, Stephen Harahan here, brandmasteracademy.com. And in this video, I'm gonna break down the rebrand of MailChimp in this brand strategy case study. So you can understand the why and the how behind a successful rebrand and leverage this effective strategy for your own brand or for your clients. Now, if you're new to the channel and you're interested in building brand strategy for yourself or for your client, then you're in the right place. Hit that subscribe button and hit the notification bell and it'll let you know when we've got new videos coming out. Now, rebranding is an extremely effective strategy, but it's also a necessary strategy sometimes as well. If you consider that most businesses that go into the marketplace don't have any real strategy at all. Now, of course, most businesses fail within the first one to three years, but there are a lot of businesses that do gain traction despite the fact that they don't have any kind of brand strategy. And when they get some revenue coming in the door, that's when they realize that, you know, they don't have a clear idea of who their audience is. They don't have a clearly defined differentiator or positioning strategy within the market and they don't have a messaging strategy either. So when they do get revenue coming in the door, that's when they get the opportunity to take another look at their brand. So that is why rebranding is sometimes very necessary for brands who have gained a little bit of traction in the market, but they don't really have that focus. But in this video, I want to dive into the rebrand of MailChimp so you can understand some decision making that goes on within a rebrand and look at how a successful brand like MailChimp navigated those difficult decisions. Now, 20 years ago, two guys by the name of Ben Chestnut and Dan Cargius saw an opportunity in the market. Now, they were entrepreneurs, they had been longtime entrepreneurs and had actually come from entrepreneurial backgrounds and entrepreneurial families. So they understood small business. And although they started to use email for their businesses, they realized that there wasn't a software out there that catered to small businesses. The email software that was available back then tended to cater for larger organizations. It was clunky. It was difficult to operate. It wasn't very user friendly and it certainly wasn't affordable. So that was their opportunity in the market. They wanted to cater to small businesses. They wanted to give them an email software that they could use that was user friendly and that was cost effective. And that's how MailChimp was born. Now, as I said, the two founders did have an entrepreneurial background. They understood the needs and the wants and the challenges of small business owners, and they stayed nimble with their business. They were able to add features when their customers needed. They were able to help them to grow, help them to evolve. But over time, their customers started to evolve in leaps and bounds, and they started to realize that they needed more than just an email platform. And that was the demand coming from their customers. They were evolving past just using email, and they wanted to go out and to build an actual brand and they wanted MailChimp to evolve with them in that journey. So MailChimp didn't reposition for the sake of repositioning and they didn't reposition for the sake of innovation either. Now, of course, the founders were pretty innovative and they did embrace innovation, but that's not why they evolved. That's not why they repositioned. Now, when you think of a lot of brands that reposition, many of them reposition because they're not really connecting with who their audience is. Their audience is not responding to the messaging that they're putting out there to their brand identity. And they want to refresh that to, you know, focus in on who their audience is and communicate with them better and resonate with them better. But MailChimp evolved from a different source. They evolved from the demand of their customers. Their customers were happy with them. They were vibing with their customers they were connecting and resonating with their customers but their customers had evolved past simple email communication and they were bringing mailchimp along for the ride they were asking mailchimp to set the path forward and to evolve with them now this insight all came about because mailchimp has a great relationship with their customers they reach out to them on a regular basis they ask them questions they survey them and the insights that they got back from their customers was that they didn't see MailChimp as an email provider. They saw them as a tool to help them be more professional, to help them seem more professional to their customers. And Ben Chestnut, the CEO, said that when they landed on that insight, it was a feeling of liberation. All of a sudden, they didn't have to stay in the niche of an e email software provider. Their customers saw them as a tool to help them be more professional. And that opened up the doors and it opened up 
the possibilities of what they could be. But long before that interview with the New York Times and long before any announcement of any rebranding or repositioning, MailChimp has, had already started to subtly change their messaging on their website. So their website was previously all about email. It was all about send better email and the messaging started to change slightly. So it went from send better email to build better brands and sell more stuff. So it was less about the micro, less about the email, more about the macro, more about helping them to solve their everyday marketing and business problems. So that was the first sign that MailChimp were repositioning themselves and rebranding was through that subtle shift in their messaging. Now, although the MailChimp visual identity had been pretty dated, that wasn't the reason behind the rebrand. The reason behind the rebrand was their evolution. They had evolved past their email niche and they needed to take a new position. They needed to take a fresh position in the marketplace. So it wasn't about the visual identity. It was more about the strategy, what they wanted to be seen as in the marketplace, they needed to shift their positioning, they needed to shift their differentiation strategy, and they needed to consider their existing customers while appealing, uh, appealing to a broader customer base. So that was the main reason behind the repositioning. It wasn't about refreshing their brand identity, they just took that as an opportunity to do both at the same time. Now, MailChimp has always been a brand oozing personality. They've always been fun, they've always been quirky, and that's been part of the reason that they were able to develop that really good relationship with their clients before the rebrand. Now, before the rebrand, their revenue was upwards of $400 million, and no doubt that they involved some advisors when it came to the rebrand. And for sure, the hot topic of conversation would have been around their strategy and their personality and their tone of voice. And you can be guaranteed that they had some suits in the room, some advisors telling them that they needed to be more of a sophisticated brand in order to appeal to a broader audience and position themselves as a marketing platform. But MailChimp, as I said, it's always been a brand steeped in personality, and that's what they held on to. They took that personality into the rebrand, and they continue that fun and quirky personality and characteristics. And that fun and quirkiness from their personality comes across in their employer branding as well. Ben Chestnut once said that I only hire weirdos and I let them fail all the time. So essentially, he's creating and has created an environment of creativity and self-expression. And that must be liberating for the brand representatives that work there. And there is this sense within the brand that the staff there, they want to be there, they want to be working for that brand, and they feel a sense of purpose in the work that they do. Now, if their brand personality was a hot topic of conversation in the boardroom with the C-suites, then you can be guaranteed that their visual identity was also a sticky topic as well, because you had a lot of technology companies at the time, the likes of Google and Spotify and Pinterest, all pulling back from this funky typography and falling into line with more of a sans serif, more of an ordered look and feel about their brand. And MailChimp rebranded at a similar time. And that is what the norm was during that time. That is what the trend was, especially when you see the likes of Google and the likes of Spotify really rebranding and becoming more conservative. The pressure would have been on the business owners to follow suit and to be more conservative, especially considering where they were going. They were going into a bigger market. They wanted to appeal to a broader audience. So the pressure definitely would have been on there to be a lot more conservative with their brand identity. And that would have brought up the topic of conversation about Freddy the Chimp. Now, Freddy would have been an absolute shoe in for the chop. And if the C-suites had their way, you definitely would have seen Freddy fall by the wayside. But the owners stayed loyal to the brand identity as well as the personality. And Freddie is still front and center in the brand identity. They have tweaked the icon slightly, but there he is front and center representing the brand. So again, this comes back to the owners and their belief in the brand that they initially built and the loyalty to those customers and what helped to build a relationship with those customers. And they stayed true to that and their personality and their tone of voice and their visual identity. Although it has changed, although it has evolved, they still have their roots in what made them successful in the first place. Now, the visual identity today is a lot more modern 
than the visual identity before the rebrand. The visual identity before the rebrand definitely needed a lot of work, but they kept a lot of those characteristics going forward in the new identity. And as I said, they went against the grain of all the other technology companies. And you really do feel that fun and energetic vibe from their visual identity, certainly with their Cavendish yellow, which is their primary color palette. And they do have a secondary color palette, with, which is a lot more flexible, but it's still very fun and quirky as well. And with their typography, Cooper Light, again, they've really kind of given the middle finger to all of those other technology companies who went the conservative route and they decided to go the other way. And they have this fun and quirkiness in their typography as well. And their illustrations are, Again, going out on another level with that fun and quirkiness, they're almost borderline uncomfortable. So, you know, they're really bringing that fun and quirkiness and those characteristics and that personality right throughout their brand identity. Now, rebranding is a delicate exercise at the best of times, but it's even more delicate when you have a loyal customer base. Now, if the owners had listened to, you know, the C-suite representatives or the advisors about the rebranding, for sure the outcome would have been completely different. But this brand and this rebrand wasn't driven by a bigger slice of the pie. It wasn't about getting more market share. It was about evolving to meet the needs of their customers. So their customers were very much a part of that rebrand and very much considered at every step of the rebrand. So it's a really important case study when it comes to rebranding. If you're rebranding for yourself, or rebranding for a client, especially if there's a loyal customer base involved, then look towards MailChimp, look towards this rebrand as an example of how to do it successfully. But I'd love to hand it back over to you. I'd love to hear from you about your experience when it comes to rebranding. Have you rebranded for yourself or have you rebranded for a client? Have you come across any sticky situations or conversations with the leadership team about where to bring the brand and how to consider the existing existing customer base. I'd love to hear your experiences. If you've got any questions or challenges in relation to rebranding, let me know in the comments below. I'll do my best to answer all of those. If you like this video, if you want to see more like this, then give it a thumbs up, hit that subscribe button. Let me know in the comments below. Hit that notification bell as well. It'll let you know when we've got new videos coming out. If you want to build brand strategies from scratch and learn how to do that, head on over to brandmasteracademy.com. Get yourself signed up for the list. I keep some exclusive content for that list and there's plenty of resources on there for you to download as well. But as I said, I'd love to hear from you about your experiences, your challenges. I'll do my best to answer all of those. Until next time, brand like a master and I will see you in the next video.